Thank you for having me. This has been an amazing experience so far. Um, I own a home computer, uh, which is very <laughs> exciting. Uh, so I'm Nick Bilton. Um, I always tell people it's like Hilton with a B because people call me Nick Bolton and then ask me if I'm related to Michael Bolton, which I am not. Um, so you're probably wondering who I am and why I, my shirt looks like a picnic table. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the work I've done at the New York Times and the Research and Development Labs. And then I'm going to talk about some new projects that I've been working on. And I just want to make sure that people understand that everything after the, the Research and Development Lab stuff is not related to the New York Times. This is my own work and um, not the opinions of the Times and so on. So I figured I would start off by telling you uh, five things about me. So uh, the first thing is that I work at the New York Times. Um, I'm the design integration editor in the R&D labs and in the newsroom. Um, and I'll explain a few things about what we're doing in the research and development labs. Um, a recent project we did is this research uh, visualization. And what we did was we wanted to look at uh, who was coming to the New York Times website uh, and where they were coming from. And so you can see that these uh, blue dots on the screen are mobile devices, and the yellow dots are from uh, home computers. Um, and uh, this is a snapshot from around uh, noon um, at, uh, on the East Coast and 8 in the morning on the West Coast. Uh, and you can see there's a lot more mobile devices because people um, are obviously commuting to work. Um, and then we wanted to look at how we can cross-correlate this information um, and look at what the articles people are reading about. So are people in New York reading about New York? Are people in San Francisco reading about New York? And, and so on. Um, another project that we've recently been doing a lot of work with is this idea called Newspaper 2.0. And it's about what the next generation of news devices could be. Uh, and we prototyped and worked with the Kindle folks. Uh, we're looking at other e-reader e devices. Um, this is uh, some flexible e-ink that we have in the lab that we've been looking at how you know, the, the flexible devices could, could come out. Uh, this is Sony's OLED display, which is uh, uh, hopefully going to be on the market soon. Um, and this is from the Arizona State University uh, Flexible Display Lab, which is funded by the Army. Um, and with the goal of putting these on the battlefield. Uh, and of course, they'll end up like GPS, uh, making it to mainstream culture. Um, another concept that we've pushed a lot is this idea called smart content, right? And so everyone that gets a print newspaper essentially gets what we call dumb content. It doesn't know what you've read or what you haven't. It doesn't know what your preferences are. Um, but when you look at a digital experience, it, it can become intelligent. Um, and so an example of that is imagine if you go to the New York Times website. Uh, and you click on this article about Iraq, and you read the story. When you pull up your mobile phone, um, your phone only has a limited amount of space. So why don't we say, hey, we know you've read that story, and there hasn't been updates. Let's hide that for you. Right? So this is this concept of smart content. So another thing uh, about me is uh, that I teach at NYU. I'm an adjunct professor. And I teach a course there called 1210. Um, and it's about designing interaction for the one foot, two foot, and 10 foot experience based on how close these screens are to your face. Um, and it's, uh, I try to teach my students that no matter what the device is, what the, the, the project is, that it's all just storytelling. You're just telling a story. Um, I'll be teaching a new course in the spring about uh, using sensors and data and, and humans uh, to report stories and how you can actually take data sets and sensors throughout the city um, and, be, and make them into reporters. Um, the third thing about me is I, I uh, co-founded a group in Brooklyn, New York called NYC Resistor. And it's a hardware hacker space. Um, and we do a lot of uh, hardware hacking and build robots and, uh, and geek out like you wouldn't even believe. Uh, and we use open source hardware. Um, and these guys are building a, a 3D um, printable robot. Uh, and we do classes in the community. And we teach people electronics and, um, and teach people how easy it is to actually build some of these things. Um, and so now the fourth thing I, uh, will be essentially what I'm here to talk about today. So uh, I'm writing a book right now about um, my uh, work in uh, thinking two to 10 years out in the research labs and, uh, and, and, and the things that I've done. Um, and th the book was originally called uh, Bite Snack Meal, The New Business of Storytelling. But the publisher thought that it would, um, people would think it was a food book in the Midwest. Uh, so we had to change the title. And ironically, uh, a, a lot of my colleagues at the time said being a food book in the Midwest may not be a bad thing. You might actually sell some copies. Um, so this is the, the new title of the book. It's I Live in the Future. Um, and uh, it's about uh, my vision of where the media and technology and devices and all these things are going. Um, if, if you want to pre-order it, you can go to that URL. Um, and so the fifth thing is, um, if, if you can't tell from all these things that I do, I have ADD. And I have really, really bad ADD. Uh, and when, you, get, uh, when you, you look at all these different things I do in data visualization and, uh, and everything, it, you, you can kind of tell. And so when I was preparing for this talk, I, I found my old report cards. And I grew up in England. And uh, in England, you get a report card from when you're two years old till when you're 18. And I found two consistencies. One was that I always got Ds. And the other was that no matter who the teacher was or what the school was, they always said I couldn't concentrate. 
right? And that my mind wanders and so on. But this has been really helpful for me later on in life, right? I've become really good at multitasking and doing multiple different things. And I'm really happy when I'm doing <laughs> numerous things at the same time, right? So if I'm playing video games and text messaging and emailing, I'm in, I'm in bliss. But don't worry, I'll make it through this talk without checking my email. Um, but we keep hearing that multitasking is bad, right? That, that we don't multitask, that our brains can't do it, um, uh, that, that society is going to change for the worse by us growing up in this video game multitasking culture, right? There's a book that just came out that actually says that it's going to put us into the dark ages. But that's not exactly true. Right? Our brains multitask all the time. Right now, I'm standing up here, I'm breathing, I'm thinking about my next slide and my previous slide. Um, I'm wondering why I didn't go to the bathroom earlier. <laughs> uh, all these different things that are going on. And so my brain is actually built to multitask. But there are limitations, right? Um, I could never stand up here and read two books at the exact same time. Right? And so what, uh, th there's an area of the brain called Brodmann's Area 10, and it's in the frontal lobe of the brain. And when you str try to do two tasks that your brain can't do, Brodmann's Area 10 becomes the board rate between those two different things. Um, and what you're seeing is when you're watching TV and you're writing an email, this area of the brain is activating backwards and forwards. And what happens is, uh, with the next generation, a lot of scientists believe uh, that this area is going to start to work faster and faster. So what happens, why do we say that multitasking is bad? And I think we have this, this technochondria about new technologies that come out. And as I was doing research for the book, I found that the railway, uh, when it first uh, was making its way into the world, um, there was a real anxiety in society. There was a, a big, big anxiety. And there's this article called The Neurasis is the Rail Railway. Um, and people actually believed that if you went on a train at 20 miles an hour that you could asphyxiate and die, right? And then there was a whole other group of people that believed if you went 40 miles an hour that your bones would explode. This is true. This, these articles in the 1800s, it's insane, right? So um, we make these dumb assumptions all the time of things that we know nothing about. Uh, but we are multitasking. And there's one thing that a lot of people can agree on. It's that we are doing it. Um, and so I wanted to explore why we're doing it. So one of the reasons is the interfaces that we've built. Um, and we've built these interfaces a little too well. Think about when you get a text message. Your phone vibrates. It beeps. You get a pop-up you have to interact with. And then you have this big, bright number that tells you, I have this message. It's almost like if we were trying to have a conversation in real life and I zapped you with a taser and held a stop sign in front of your face, <laughs> right? It's, it's just, it works too well. It's jarring. The other reason is that, that we have a tremendous amount of media to consume. Um, and we, because of so much, we, we simultaneously consume it, right? So if you go back to, uh, to, to before the printing presses, I'll explain how we kind of got here. Um, before the printing presses, nobody read. Um, it was only the, the monks and the clergies and so on that read. And in society, people would stand around in the bars, and they would watch people stand on soapboxes. And they were part of the discussion. They were part of the, of the discussion of the day. And at this point in time, the largest library in Europe had 122 books. Okay? And along comes the printing press. And everyone thinks, well, the printing press changed everything, right? But that's not exactly true either. The printing press um, changed a little bit slowly. But this is Gutenberg's Bible. Um, and uh, it weighed 50 pounds, and it was two uh, volumes, which were 100 pounds each, um, to total, sorry. Um, and when you looked at this, it's essentially the equivalent to, to computers 50 years ago, right? You couldn't carry this around. You couldn't go lay in the park and enjoy this, this book. And what happened was uh, uh, this, uh, this gentleman, Aldous Man Manitus, um, in 1502, said, why don't we make these things smaller so we can put them in our pockets? And which is when we got the mobile book, which is essentially the equivalent to when we got the mobile phone today. Um, and what happened was people started to read, right? And it started to develop nations, and it started to, to concrete and cement the, the idea of, of what language was. And all of these, these huge changes took place. Um, and at home, in the living room, um, it became a place where we would stand around, sit around at, at when we got home from work and from school, and we would read. And everything was fine, and this is how life, life went on. And we had enough time during the day still to, to talk to our friends and our family. And then along comes the radio. And uh, when the radio comes along, we put our books down, and we put our newspapers down, and we sit in the living room, and look how happy these people are. And they're listening to the radio, and, and that's what happens. And then the radio became successful. And so people, uh, they created more and more radio shows. So we have news and documentary radio, and we start to see the first signs of multitasking, right? Because we don't have enough time in the day to listen to all these shows, and we don't have enough time in the day to, to, to read our books and our newspapers, and so we start to do it at the same time. And then comes the television, and the television takes over the living room, and we have to find a new home for the radio. And it goes into the car, and we start driving and listening to the radio. And we have, essentially, media multitasking. 
And so now we live in a world where I'm on my laptop, watching TV, writing emails, text messaging, tweeting, playing my Nintendo DS, and all of these things at the same time. And what's happening is our brains are adapting, right? Um, and I want to be clear that it's not evolution. You know, we keep on thinking that this, this kind of stuff is evolution. Evolution takes place over hundreds of thousands of years. It doesn't take place over 20 years with the internet, or 800 years with books, or even 5,000 years with words, with the alphabet. Um, when I was researching my book, I, I found uh, Marianne Wolfe, uh, who wrote the book uh, uh, Proust and the Squid. And she said that, um, and the book is about how our brains have adapted to reading and, and, and what, what actually happens within our brains when we do this. Uh, and she said that she came to a very unsettling conclusion, that our brains have still not adapted or evolved uh, to reading. Um, and an example for this is a study that came out a couple of weeks ago in Nature. Um, and uh, it was a study from Spain, and, um, and this gentleman wanted to understand why people uh, read um, and what happens in their brains when they do. And they found a group of people in South America who uh, were illiterate. And when they, uh, st when they were reading, they would uh, they put them in fMRI scanners before and fMRI scanners afterwards, and they found new parts of the brain that, that, that grew and existed afterwards in the white matter of the brain. So our brains are still learning how to do this. Uh, another study that shows what's happening today is, uh, came out of uh, Gary Small's neuroscience lab at UCLA. And uh, these are two groups of people that are reading a book on the left and uh, surfing the web on the right. And you can see that the, the net savvy group on the right, uh, there's twice as many voxels that are being activated when they're surfing the web. So it's a whole new form of storytelling. And we're also seeing this in video games. Um, a, a study that came out a few weeks ago, um, there's, there's thousands and thousands of studies about the positive effects of video games. Uh, but one that came out a few weeks ago was this about Tetris in the brain um, from Richard Harris Lab at University of California. And he found that people that played uh, uh, Tetris um, after uh, being tested, uh, they had increased attention, hand-eye coordination, memory. Uh, they had increased visual spatial recognition. And these things transferred over into, uh, into other parts of their life, right? Uh, and it, you can see that the video games and the internet and all of these things are a new form of narrative that we're learning how to do. And they're not bad things. It's just a new generation of, of how we're communicating and telling stories. And so what does this mean for newspapers, right? What does this mean for news? Um, and so I kind of want to wrap up with, 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 with my thoughts on this. And we always talk about, when we talk about news, we talk about business models. But I kind of feel like if we're talking about business models, we're kind of getting ahead of what we really should be talking about. And what we should re really should be talking about is the fact that everything about news is changing, right? <clears throat> if you think about the devices that you consume news on, that's changing. I used to read a news, my newspaper, and I put that down, and off I went and did something else. But now I read the news on the same device that I text message my family, and that I email my friends, and that I send text messages and tweets to, to all these different people. And so I have a completely different psychological and visceral experience with that device. And so I'm going to have that same psychological experience with that, that news experience, too. Um, the other thing that's happening is the relevance of news is changing, right? Um, an example of this is uh, when Kennedy died. Um, I don't want to sound heartless, but this was not news to me. I didn't grow up with Kennedy as a part of my life. It would have been like King Henry VIII dying, right? It just didn't mean anything to me. <clears throat> but to a lot of people in this room, I'm sure it did. And it's also an example of uh, there was a shooting in the park across the street from my house. That was big news to me. And it probably wasn't news for anybody else unless you live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so our whole concept of what news is is changing, right? Um, and another thing that's happening is, is when you couple that with our social networks, um, this is news to us. If somebody in my social network that I'm friends with says they just got in a car accident, that's news, right? I had an incident a couple of weeks ago where uh, a friend was over, uh, a younger friend in her early 20s, and she said, can I use your computer to, to check the news? And I said, sure. And <clears throat> a couple of minutes go by, and I said, out of curiosity, what news site are you on? And she goes, oh, I'm on Facebook. And so for her, that's the news, right? <clears throat> so all of these things are changing. The whole concept of locations are changing. We used to buy newspapers and news based on the location that we lived in. Now we can consume news from anywhere. Our whole concept of trust is changing. You know, a recent Pew study that came out said that we trust the news media on average 29% and we trust our friends and family 90%, right? That's a big, big difference. Um, and the, the concept of who reports news is changing. And I think this is the fundamental, uh, fundamental thing that's changing here. Um, if you go back to uh, the very first newspaper uh, that ever came out, it was called Public Occurrences in Amsterdam. Um, and Zach Seward from the Neiman Lab gave me this. Um, and it was four pages long. And the last page over here, this blank page, was left blank intentionally. And it was left blank because people were encouraged to write on it and be a part of the conversation. And they were encouraged to write their comments about the articles and then pass it along to someone else. 
And over time, news became a big business, became a huge business. And people were shut out of the conversation, right? And all that they really had was this letter to the editor in the back of the paper that was edited, and that was it. But now, we all have a printing press, right? Every single person has the exact same printing press. Not just that we have them, everyone has it. And it's changing everything. And it's, it's swinging this pendulum back into the middle. So people are part of the conversation again. And I believe that we all have a social responsibility to report news. I don't think that it should be left just to the news organizations, and I don't think it should be left just to the people. I think that there's somewhere in the middle that we do this. And if you look at the next generation, they're growing up in a world where all they do is take pictures, they're a part of the conversation, they're commenting, they're uploading videos. For them, this is the world, the world that they live in. There was a, a, a session at um, uh, Web 2.0 a couple of days ago, and the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal said there's two people in the world. There's consumers and um, creators, and there's aggregators. There's not, they, don't, they don't merge. And I think for his generation, that makes sense. But for our generation, I think that is completely inaccurate. I think that this, this generation is growing up in a world where they consume, and they create, and they aggregate, and they do everything. And it's going to change the way we report, and the way we tell stories, and the way we consume stories. And these are all the people that died on 9-11. And could you imagine today if 9-11 happened? Imagine the stories that we would hear, and the, the, the videos, and the photos, and the tweets of, of the inside of what would have happened there. And it would have changed the entire concept of, of, of the news experience. And so yes, society is changing, uh, but I think it's for the good. I think it's for the better. Thank you. Thank you.